Prime Minister Mohammed has said that he wants to recover four and a half billion dollars from one MDB. And you were cited as saying that can be done through Goldman as well as assets seized in the U.S. Is that really the case? Is that the plan? Well, we are hopeful of recovering that amount. But, uh, you know, I, I will probably take a very uh, conservative estimate. Probably we only get back around 10%. Although, uh, perhaps, uh, maybe if you are lucky, you can go up to 30%. But at the, uh, at the very least, uh, 10% of, uh, of what they have stolen. Uh, bearing in mind that we are paying 50 billion ringgit. And that works up to around probably 11, uh, no, around 12 billion US dollars, 12 to 13 billion US dollars. So if you can get 30%, that will work up to around three and a half billion, as you have mentioned. But uh, at the very least 10%, uh, and uh, as I said, that's still not sufficient because, you know, what happened to the remaining 70 or 80 or 90%? And that's why I think justice must be done. We want to ensure that those who were part of this deal and this arrangement, they can cough out, they should cough out any monies that they've received uh, and return it back to the people because they were unwitting victims uh, in this, uh, what do you call that, this global scandal, the largest scam in history. But why only 10%? What are the indications? What are you hearing? Because we couldn't locate, we couldn't trace where the money went and what did they purchase, what did they buy, what were their assets, we just cannot trace them. And those that we can trace, there's also questions of, uh, you know, of uh, ownership, uh, due process and so has uh, different national jurisdictions. And that, there's also a question of cost. After deducting for all the expenses incurred, how much is left? And that's why I'm looking at around 10 to 30 percent. Might you want to claw back from other players like JP Morgan, which was involved in the dollar transactions? Are you talking about Goldman Sachs, you mean? Goldman Sachs, yes, but JP Morgan handled the dollar transactions. Might you want to claw back money from them? No, I, I think that we have to assess uh, in terms of uh, that fiduciary duty. Do they have that fiduciary duty? Uh, Goldman Sachs is very clear. Uh, J.P. Morgan is something that we need to look at. Lah. I think there needs to be some clarity there first. So I do not want to make any prejudgment. Uh, we'll leave it to the uh, Attorney General and also the uh, legal investigative panel, the special legal investigative panel established to, uh, to deal and to, of course, uh, uh, get to the bottom of the GST. So uh, sorry, the, to get to the bottom of the one MDB scandal. So fair to say that right now we are not exploring other banks and their involvement in 1MDB? I think first we have to, to um, identify uh, not only the wrongdoings, uh, you've you got to focus on the main characters. And then later you see where are the uh, accessories, so to say. But uh, I think unless you can nail down, you can lock down the main players involved, uh, we shouldn't be uh, talking uh, further than what we're able to achieve. So we don't want to, of course, uh, overreach and overextend ourselves. At the same time, we also want to get cooperation from our parties so that we can nail down the main culprits. I think that is paramount. Uh, Malaysia has said that its own investigation, domestic investigation, is almost complete. It's now waiting to see evidence from overseas. What are you hearing and what are you getting so far in terms of evidence? I've, I've heard, I've heard, of course, we, we, we are kept up to date with some of the developments and investigations, but uh, in the interest of confidentiality and, of course, respect for the investigations, uh, I'm not able to disclose anything. Can you give... Uh, any clarification on reports suggesting that Malaysia has issued warrants to two uh, offices of 1MDB? Well, we were told that, of course, that uh, the warrants will be issued where necessary. But again, I think it would be uh, more appropriate if uh, this information is disclosed by the relevant authorities. Yes. I would just like to stick to, uh, I think, my ambit of... Uh, my ambit of my powers, 
which is to conduct investigations. And if the outcome of these investigations disclose wrongdoing, I'll submit it to the investigative panel or to the Attorney General for further action to be taken. And we are playing, of course, uh, we, we, are, we are conducting uh, a forensic audit and we want to assist uh, both the Attorney General and also the relevant parties to make sure that they can get the job done. And we are very pleased. I saw the uh, Attorney General for Switzerland uh, last week uh, and um, we had a very good discussion. And he, he was very confident that we could get something done. And, uh, and really, we, we, we are very grateful and we are very appreciative of the efforts of these countries, uh, without which I think uh, everything would be gone. So at least there is still this paper trail, and hopefully a money trail, that uh, we hope that we can get to the source. Since you became the finance minister, you said that you've uncovered uh, suspicious transactions, including two pipeline projects with China linked to 1MDB. Have you uncovered more suspicious transactions since? Well, uh, it's actually with Chinese companies, not with China. No, we have problems with Goldman Sachs, as I've mentioned, because the advice that they've given, and despite that, we pay actually 100 to 120 basis points higher than the market. So we are wondering, why are we paying 600, nearly 600 million US dollars for such advice? You know? uh, well, our problem is not with the United States of America, it is with the company. So I think we should distinguish or differentiate the company and the country. We have no problems with the US. Of course, our issue is with the company. Similarly, when you talk about the gas pipelines, it is with the Chinese company, it is not with the country. So uh, in that respect, uh, we, have, uh, we are shocked actually that uh, payments have been made, even though no work has been done on the ground. Uh, and uh, what is uh, alarming is that uh, nearly at all, more than 88% of the project value has been paid. More than 88% of the project value has been paid, even though little work has been done on the ground. So why is there such a favor favorable treatment that is not even given to Malaysian contractors? Never in Malaysian history has payment been made even though work has not been done principally because they are working through a timing mechanism. That means, that would mean simply this, that as long as, uh, what do you call it? Uh, no, oh, uh, that you have to make payment over a fixed period, regardless whether work is done or not. So every three months, periodically, you have to make payments. That doesn't make sense. So is there a resolution to what you're seeing right now? Are you in talks with the Chinese companies? Well, we have actually uh, issued instructions that work must be suspended. And uh, until then, I think this is to allow um, uh, a, a period for us to assess and also to discuss the future of these projects. And of course, these talks are still ongoing. But what's the sense then? What are the viable solutions? Could it be a cancellation of the projects? Could it be maybe lower rates? Well, all options are on the table. Any preferred option? Well, I think it would be prejudicial of me for me to state what are my preferred options when we need to discuss this with the other parties. And bear in mind that it also involves uh, companies from another country. Uh, but uh, all options are, of the, are on the table. I, I, would not, I would definitely not discount the possibility of a cancellation that you have mentioned. But uh, as I said, uh, anything is possible. And uh, uh, we are still uh, deliberating on uh, the various uh, options available. Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad is due to visit China in August. Will these projects be discussed? Is that the intention? I would think that the uh, visit, official visit will be talking about national matters. Such as? Yes. of uh, importance to improve the relationship between both countries, especially our trading links. You know, China is our largest trading partner. They are a very important player mm. uh, in our economy. Uh, I think what we want to uh, impress upon the uh, Chinese is that uh, we want to be a valuable partner, but based on mutuality of interest, has two separate 
and independent sovereign states. So I think this mutuality of interest must be based on, co on common principles. Uh, uh, freedom, justice, rule of law, common respect, and of course um, a win-win formula for everyone. Uh, and I'm sure that we also want to impress upon the Chinese that uh, any deals that has entered into, uh, I mean in general terms, without going through specifics, uh, must benefit both sides and must be also be fair to both sides. Uh, I think this, uh, this mutuality of interest and also its corollary, the benefits, um, is something that we want to, to stress, that this will be different from the previous regime where somehow the interest of the country is not taken into account. Uh, and some of these uh, contracts that were entered into were at the expense of the people of Malaysia. But this will not be the principal issues that we discuss, if at all. I mean, we'll be talking about general principles rather than going into specifics. I think the Prime Minister wants to focus uh, by looking forward what uh, both countries uh, can benefit by strengthening our relationship. And, you know, we've got a very strong uh, existing and existing strong ties between both countries. Uh, uh, you know, China became our largest trading partner uh, recently. And uh, they, they will continue to play an important role. But at the same time, as I mentioned, uh, as a sovereign state, uh, I think we want to ensure that we remain in independent that uh, any uh, relationship must be conducted through this mutuality of interest that I mentioned, and of course has a, uh, has a, a, a state that is able to determine and to decide on our future. Now, China has also shown interest, wants to collaborate with Malaysia on huge infrastructure projects, for instance. Uh, can you cite what's been discussed and what kind of projects can be, can be expected? Now, I think we, we, we take these comments by China very positively. It shows that they also want to move forward and that they, they value uh, Malaysia as a trading partner and also has an ally in uh, uh, ensuring that uh, the ASEAN region can be a zone of peace, freedom and neutrality. When we talk about projects, we also have to talk about the high-speed rail project with Singapore. The Prime Minister has said that it's probably it will probably be deferred. Uh, your take on that and what would it take for the project to take off ground? Well, if the Prime Minister says that it should be deferred, then it will be deferred. So I, uh, I think that the, uh, the Prime Minister uh, has the final say. Uh, but uh, the Minister Asmin will be going to Singapore to finalise the deliberation. So I would not like to preempt him. I wouldn't wish to preempt him. So I think let's wait for the outcome of his visit to Singapore. Singapore has suggested that some kind of compensation will be needed. Has anything been discussed? I think that is in the agreement. I'm sure there will be, this will be discussed in the event that uh, the project is terminated. Um, of course, uh, the quantum involved is, will, would be disputed. Um, but let's wait for the outcome of the visit or the outcome of the meeting. So as I said, I do not want to preempt. Uh, my colleague when he visits or when he discusses this with his Singapore counterpart. Let's talk about growth. Given the cancellation of projects, austerity measures, the 1MDB scandal and the extent of it, is it still realistic to expect Malaysia to grow between 55 to 6% or would you have to relook at those numbers? No, when you talk about cancelling projects, when you talk about uh, removing GST, Bear in mind that we are also pumping in money indirectly into the local economy. For instance, we expect to receive uh, 23 billion ringgit less from the removal of GST. But that would mean that we'll be injecting 23 billion ringgit back to the local economy. Because when people pay less taxes, they got more money on their hands. And that works out to 23 billion ringgit a year. So. I would think that this would definitely help to grow the economy. Uh, the, the money would remain in the local markets and it will not be taken out of the country. The money will not be used to purchase uh, handbags or jewellery or what have you. you know, it will remain in the country. So 
I would think that uh, whilst uh, these projects are cancelled, uh, again, when these projects are priced exorbitantly, it doesn't help the country's economy. Instead, by uh, putting the country on the uh, heavy debt load, I think you are probably jeopardizing the health of the economy. Let's become debt. How do you intend to cut debt? Well, I think we have to, of course, ensure that, uh, number one, that we will not default. And I think that we have done, uh, that, that we have uh, not only uh, given that assurance, but we have delivered by uh, making all our debt obligations, by paying up all our debt obligations. Uh, that's number one. Number two, of course, uh, we have to ensure that we can, again, retire some of the debt. Uh, there will be a need for some refinancing because some of the debt was really priced at a very uh, unfavorable rate. As I said, uh, 100 and 120 basis points above market rates. That alone would allow us to, uh, to save a substantial amount in interest payments. So I believe that we will be able to uh, manage our debt and as our economy grows. Uh, I think this will of course uh, reduce proportionally, but not just in relative terms, but also in absolute terms. Uh, we will have to, uh, of course, uh, ensure that we are able to meet our obligations, and so far we are able to do so, and that will naturally reduce our debt. The, the economic growth is a very important factor, because when the economy grows, then uh, there's confidence that revenue will come in, there's still confidence from uh, investors, as well as fund managers, that we can meet our fiscal targets, and most important of all, to ensure that the stable monetary sector will remain, will remain healthy. So 55 to 6% growth is manageable, is attainable? Well, I would say 5%. I wouldn't want to be too ambitious because with the trade war, uh, I'll, I'll probably uh, say around 5%. And that's something we think that can be achieved. How concerned are you about the trade war, the trade tensions that we're seeing between China and Who the US? Who is not concerned about the trade war? How, how, how much impact will it have on the Malaysian economy? There will be no direct impact. But if the global economy slows, as a trading nation, definitely Malaysia will be negatively impacted. So at the moment, we do not see that happening yet. But we are keeping a close eye. Uh, the, the trade war is actually principally between the United States and not just China, but other countries throughout the world. And, yet, and as long as it has not slowed down the economy, we are doing okay. But if the economic, global economic growth is affected, then definitely Malaysia will be affected. But By, if, but to what extent? Maybe, is it half, half a percent perhaps sh shaven off from your growth uh, It depends on how much the global economy slows. But let's say that if things can be kept on even keel, uh, there are also opportunities for us. Not only has a transshipment point, but also has a neutral country in this dispute, which allows both China and American companies to invest and also export their products. So, for instance, and on the other hand, for, uh, uh, we can also be a substitute for products that are subjected to tariffs. For instance, uh, uh, soybean oil will not be purchased by China a very useful substitute will be palm oil. China can buy palm oil. So these are opportunities that is open to Malaysia. What's your take on the ringgit in the second quarter is down about 4% to the USD. What's fair value for the currency? Well, the Prime Minister has said 380. I will stick with what the Prime Minister says. So you're comfortable with the movements right now? No, I think we do not want to influence and interfere. We, we prefer to let the market decide. Even though sometimes we think the market is probably uh, undervalued the strength of the ringgit. But uh, we want to let the market decide. You, you know that once the central bank uh, intervenes aggressively, you cannot beat the market. So they have to sort it out themselves. Uh, if there's any disparity, uh, in, especially in a cross rates, I think arbitrage, arbitrage will 
work and takes the necessary effect. But uh, I would say that uh, has uh, the foreign investors realizes our commitment to make structural changes, structural reforms, uh, to heal our nation's finances, and also to continue to adopt a transparent, accountable, and competent approach towards economic management. I'm sure that they will come back uh, strongly to invest in Malaysia. Uh, bear in mind that our economic fundamentals are strong. Uh, we, our banks are well capitalized. We have very low non-performing loans ratio. Uh, the uh, capital markets has high liquidity. And uh, generally, the monetary sector is stable. So uh, we do not see why, when our fiscal position improves, why the ringgit will not strengthen, or why investment would not, or the capital flows will not uh, return in force. Uh, and so far, that the fact that many investors are having a second look or relooking at Malaysia has an investment uh, destination. I think that shows that they are interested in our emphasis on transparency and the need to tell the truth in terms of financial numbers. Minister, Malaysia is looking to balance its budget realistically. When can that happen? I think that will take a bit of time. Uh, bearing in mind that we are... What is a bit of time? We are not focused on balancing the budget as, as much as trying to ensure that we keep to our targets. Because bear in mind that we want to reduce our debt. The mountain of debt left to us by the previous government, a one trillion ringgit debt. So I think that would remain our focus. And once we reduce that, both in absolute and relative terms, in proportion to the GDP, sometimes it is not the debt that haunts you. It's your ability to repay that is the most important element. And I think the investors and the fund managers know that. So a balanced budget maybe in about three years? <laughs> I, as I said, that would not be our primary objective. Uh, as I say again, uh, reducing our debt, uh, demonstrating our ability to pay, and also competent, accountable and transparent management of the eco economy coupled with structural reforms, uh, which will ensure our long-term growth, stability and health in the long term. I think that would be paramount. Minister, just one final question. A lot of people have said that this is the new Prime Minister, Mahathir 2.0. How has it been working with him? And how much control do you have over your own finance ministry policies? Well, finally, it's a Prime Minister who decides. I think you have to accept that uh, we have a Westminster form of government, where even though he's a member of cabinet, he's the first amongst equals. Paris inter Paris. He's the first among his equals. And, uh, uh, and he picks the cabinet. So you have to acknowledge his leadership. And unless, of course, you want to be an outlier, uh, then you'll be out of cabinet. But I think ideologically, as well as in, uh, in, in terms of principles, we share the same ideas. And I do not think there's been any disconnect or there's been any uh, uh, misalignment of principles as well as uh, our uh, uh, interest. Interest in wanting to see a healthy uh, financial situation, fiscal situation for the government, uh, uh, alignment in terms of wanting to reduce our debt, and alignment in terms of wanting to move the country forward and to free Malaysia from this image, this shameful image of being a global kleptocracy. We want to free Malaysia from corruption. We want to tell the world that Malaysia is no longer a global kleptocracy, that we are a government with dignity and honour, and we want to run a clean government, a competent government that will benefit our people first and foremost. At the same time, we want to be a responsible member of the international community that respects rule of law. A rules-based system will be our guiding post. 
Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you.